Jake House. Great to see you, mate. How's things? Mate? Very well, very well. Uh, young family, growing up very quickly, but yeah, very, very happy and, and life's moving forward. Ten years ago, this is how I start pretty much all of these interviews. Now, ten years ago, we were watching you and I was interviewing after each and one of these games that we played in the conference and now Luton in the Premier League. Can you believe how time has flown and where Luton are now? I, I still now, I, I can't believe it. Even my, all my friends of weekends, just even watching them match of the day, however it is, it's quite amazing really to see where the club is, even now looking out on the ground with the new stand. It's just remarkable, really. There's still old faces here that you always say hello to and they'll all be part of, part of the club. Mm. But yeah, it's just to see where the club is now is quite amazing, yeah. So we've gone from non-league to Premier League in the space of 10 years, obviously a fairy tale story, but for, for, for your own personal story, I mean, it began, I think, you know, way back in the, in the mid-2000s, coming through the, through, the, through the youth team, and then making your debut, debut at home to Huddersfield at the end of the 07-08 season, remember that? I do. The, the shirt was way too big for me, I knew that, um, but I remember Big Mick saying to me, right, get warm, you're going to come on. He put me on left back. Um, Don Hutchinson was playing centre half, who at the time, was paying out of his wage to pay for me. Weren't a lot of money, don't get me wrong, it was like 60 quid a week back then as scholarship money, but playing League, league One football, it was quite, quite a thing. Um, but yeah, obviously like anyone's dream, name on the back of your shirt, coming on, especially here, because I'm, I'm sort of one of the, mm. the key players that Luton fans could really get, get alongside and support. So for me it was, yeah, the, people say it's your best, best ever moment in football. Um, and then obviously the following season, we relegated that season, and the start of the following yeah. season, we were you know given a two deductions that meant minus thirty. I think you were eighteen, nineteen at the time. Yeah, you? so it was it was a strange feeling for me because it was an opportunity, but also knew the club were were struggling. It was the darkest times of the club's history, mm. and I knew that. Even being a young lad, I knew that. Um, but I also see the the opportunity it presented. I still had key. Key influential professionals around me, Sol Davis, the, Kevin Nichols just left. I had people that could really influence my full career, not just there and then. Um, and I still remember it now, and Sol was one of the, the best around. And I used to clean his boots, I was, that was my fellow duty. Left footer. Yeah, fellow left footer. Um, and obviously watched him in training and just sort of mirrored everything he did. And he always used to say to me, you're going to be way better than I was, sort of thing. But I was always cleaning his boots, and there was obviously match days where I'd start in front of Sol. Mm. So it was a weird, it was a weird dynamic. But to have someone like Sol pushing me along and guiding me, it was I, I was so fortunate in that that aspect. What was it like dealing with that deduction as a player? I mean, I think at the, before the Port Vale game, first game of that season, I think if you look on the back of the mm. program, it was just blank because we didn't even know what the squad was going to be. What was yeah. pre-season like for that for that particular season? You didn't um, even probably know that who your no, teammates were going to be. You wouldn't. You wouldn't. You'd had, we had a core sort of base of the, the players that were going to stay and they committed to the club for different reasons. Mine was because, one, I, I loved what the club and give me that platform to be a footballer. But then you had Sol who had a great history with the club as well. There was a base and foundation of players that stayed with the club. And now it's sort of, we were seeing a lot of trialists coming for pre-season, maybe players that were coming down the leagues and was like, Do you know what, I'll get games at Luton at that time. And we were sort of a platform for people to really build on. Obviously, we, I weren't there for, for that anything else apart from get Luton back to where they want to be. Um, it was a difficult period, extremely difficult period. And then you sort of, we started seeing people come in on loan, like Chris Martin, and we were like, hold on, we've got, we, we can get out of this. Well, there was a period where we thought we could get out of it. Um, I think psychologically, it was very tough because you would win a game and you're still minus points. And it's, mm. it's sort you're of, looking at the league table a lot. You do, because you just want to see who's struggling as, as well around you, and you can see it happening. And every week we're winning games or losing games, and you're still in the minus. And once you got to the zero, you're like, right, now we can start our season. I can't remember when it was when we got to that position, but it just was, it was draining. And we used to play Darlington away, I remember it, and it's a long way to go, and you'd, still, you'd win, and you're still minus 10 points. And it's like, how do we get out of this? And how, do we, how does the club get back to where it is or where it is now as such? And that was always my belief that... The club was on a journey and I was sort of part of that. So for me, it was to get as many games and an experience under my belt at that time and just learn the game of football. Obviously, you went through some plenty of highs and lows at, at your time here. I, I mean, even getting to the, you know, to the JPT final and for that, you know, you weren't involved as mm -hmm. well. So another kind of lesson for you as a young player to, you know, experience it, but sadly not being a part of, you know, the match day. 15 or whatever. Yeah, it, obviously I think I played every game up until the final, Brighton and the game before that was here. 
Um, Mick pulled me into a meeting just before at the hotel the night before the game and he sort of said, look, I, you're not going to be involved for different reasons. I think Lewis Emmanuel just got back fit. Mm. Sol was obviously playing, I think, at that time, or he was thinking about playing Sol. He said, I can't really have another one of you on the bench. And I said, look, I understand it. It's football. This, they might not get this opportunity. But he said, look, stay with it. One day you will play at, at Wembley again, and one day you will climb the leagues, and, and all positive. So Mick was the best at that man management sort of skill. Um, obviously, I was gutted on the day not to play, but I was still involved and warmed up and did the whole experience, which was... Yeah, I'll never forget it. And we're here to talk about the good times, but it, it's, it, it pains me to keep like hitting the the bad times at you. But just just wanted to, you know, get an understanding of what it was like to be a player to have played so many games here and mm -hmm. in front of so many fans on the road for a team that were struggling mm -hmm. and not just struggling, but also perhaps failing to kind of reach expectations once we were yeah. relegated to the conference. What was that like? When, so the following season, our first season in non-league, what was then that like? What was the expectation? Did you feel that on yourself even at absolutely. such a young age? Yeah, absolutely. Because I got to a point where I was probably 19, 20 and I played a lot of games by then, maybe 200 games But by that point. So people were seeing me as an experienced player at the club. So any new signings would come straight to me and be like, what's it like? I've heard about Luton, Kenilworth Road. What's the atmosphere, the fans on your side and things like that. And I always would just say, give everything you can while you're on that pitch because that's, that's all the fans want and they, even now if you run as hard as you can for 90 minutes the fans will be behind you it was very tough because you the, the expectation changed from we knew we we're getting relegated to now we expect to win the league by five to ten points and you go into away games which the club's never been to before um, and it was a realization that it's not easy as you drop the leagues and we didn't have quite the standard of player to get us up that, that quickly. We didn't have the special five core players at that time. That It all clicked for us. So that first season, we really struggled to really put it all together. Fans were starting to get a little bit frustrated because we weren't quite performing on the pitch with the expectation. And I was feeling it as well. I'm like a fan. I am definitely a fan now. But at that time when we were playing games and not quite winning, especially here, I felt the pressure more than probably anyone. Um, and just like I said to you before the camera, where I was getting on the bus when I was a, a kid, with the fans after the game, I can hear the energy and it, the, the negativity around the club at the time. And it was, it was tough. It was very, very tough. Um, it taught me a lot. It, even, even now in my real life, it, is, it teaches you a lot outside of the football side of things. Um, extremely proud to obviously represent the club at any level, but it was, it was a tough period, yeah. And then let's just, you know, it's just another, t you know, two playoff failures after that. Mm. And you played in both of those as well. I mean, as you talked about missing a, missing a game at Wembley, but then having the, you know, going to play York there as well, see the previous season yeah. uh, against AFC Wimbledon. Was there a stage in which you were like, is this ever going to happen? And also, was there a stage where like, I can't do this here anymore. Do I, I need to get out of here. That was never my. That was never my case. My thinking was never this jump ship. I, I think I was so engrossed in the journey of Luton Town, and what the, the I, I owed a lot to the club. They gave me a platform in professional football, and they've always supported me. And every fan has always backed me, and I can't knock them for that. So I was never jumping ship at that point at all. It was all about how can I go again, and I was very driven outside of football in terms of. Before pre-season, I'd be still running every day and I'd want to be the fittest when I come back. We'd go to Portugal every pre-season and I'd always win the running and I'd always want to be at the front of everything I did. So I was very, very much driven in that aspect. But it was more, I think the Wimbledon one really hit me. It, it was tough. I had obviously all my family up at the Etihad and we lost on penalties. And just to be that close and when Walker hit the post for my cross last minute normal time, it's an inch away from going in and, and that relief and that pressure on my shoulders personally, because I, I brought it on myself to get the club back into the league. It was tough and to, to miss out on penalties was very, very tough. To lose again by an offside decision that Kino would tell you about, is, mm -hmm. he still tells me every time I see him, it's again, it's challenging for you to, to get over. But it was then, it got to a point where I knew so, something clicked the, the pre-season after and I was fitter than ever. Um, a lot of changes were happening in terms of personnel, managers, things were happening and it just seemed to come together in that pre-season. I mean, you played under, so, you know, played under mm. several managers here as well. Yeah. I mean, obviously we'll talk about John a bit later, but you always, you always kept your place in the team, so you knew you were doing something right and I guess by your own token, you're maturing as a player because as you said earlier, like, mm. you're only like 19, 20 men 
having played so many games, you're becoming a senior member of the team, even though you're you know early twenties. Yeah, and you get looked at that as like I say with new people coming into the club, but even the current club, because you know all the staff, you know the receptionist when you come on match days, and you you get that personal relationship with everyone. Um, it, it's quite a feeling knowing everyone. Like I say, yourself, even with you back then as well, you know everyone, and it that you don't get any other club. And I know that now, obviously playing at other clubs, you don't get that personal effect anywhere else you go, and. Yeah, not just you, don't get me wrong. <laughs> you get other use, but yeah, it's, it's a different club to anyone ever yeah. realises. Um, so anyone that comes into the club has to buy into what the club's culture is. And that's just running your heart out and giving everything you can. Don't get me wrong, everyone has bad games. Yeah. I, I had many of them, don't get me wrong. But I can, I can guarantee the player knows before anyone else if they're playing well or not. It's just how it is. Um, and even now me, I'm the best player when I'm sitting on the side watching. Don't get me wrong. I'm, even now, Pelly, I tell him like that's not enough, sort of thing. So there's, there's, there's that's part of football. Um, but I was very fortunate. A lot of managers had faith in me to put me out there a lot, and I, I played a lot of games very, very quickly in my career, which gave me a different skill set in life um, and experiences in football that no one else had. I think playing as many as I did so quickly. Following season, this will work chronologically. Mm. Our worst season, actually, mm. but also an important season because John still came to the club. I actually remember a game here, I think you scored in it against Hyde. Mm -hmm. Possibly the lowest point of yeah. Luton's history, I would say. Mm -hmm. But even when he came in at that point, and there was obviously a couple of difficult matches, still under John at the end of that season, I think he was still kind of working out what he needed, what he wanted, who, do you, who, who he wanted mm -hmm. to keep. Obviously you were one of them. Mm -hmm. What was that transition period like? going from Paul Buckle to John Steele and then how he kind of then implemented that going into the next season? It, it, all managers have their different ways of playing and setups. and when a manager they literally run the club um, and, and Bucks was a little bit different to what we had previously with, with Brabin and Richard Money and people like that so everyone had their own ways and their, their favourites as well that they wanted to play. Um, when John came in he, he sort of bring it back to basics very very quickly and I remember at his first session it was very much basics in this is how we're going to set up, this is how we're going to play um, and we played Stockport away on our in his first game. We won one 0 I scored. I think I, sh I probably should have scored a couple more actually, out of memory. But from then on, the, the club changed in general anyway. And that was just John. We knew the season fizzled out. We knew that, but it was about rebuilding for the next season. So in a way, it, it got the players thinking, "I want to be here with John." You next got that year. feeling. You yeah. got that feeling straight away. And he was, he was very articulate in how he wanted to play. And some some people say old school. Some say clever. He knew the league. However, it was. He knew what he was doing every time we, we stepped on that pitch and every player knew exactly what we were doing as well. So did you go into that season thinking we, we've got something here, there's something good going on? We, we had like a, a base and we had 11, probably, uh, probably 11 to 14 players that knew who's going to play. If not, then they're not playing because of this player's playing in their place. And you can name the 11 pretty much mm. off the cuff, which helped because you get the consistency. But you also had winners in there as well that were fearless like Andre and, and people like that and you had experience around them like Benno and Guts who would link up the play and, and win you games that you probably wouldn't have won of or seen out games that you probably wouldn't have the last few years um, but when you have someone like Andre on, on your team scoring anything he hits it, it obviously helps. And going back on that experience that you were talking about from your own personal point mm -hmm. of view could you feel as though they were like I'm a, I'm a senior pro here yeah and, you know I'm still like still young like early 20s but I feel as though I've kind of like really arrived now. This is like what I want, wanted my career to be. Yeah, because I knew, knew something was happening with, like anything, I was always very, very hopeful and positive that the club would get back to where they need to be. But with John coming in and he had a way of doing things and he's sort of very reassuring in how he, he preps for games and things like that. He's set pieces, routines. He's very, just, he knows his detail and he knows he used to call it sort of dead ball situations, like corners, free kicks, penalties. They win you leagues and, mm. and win you more games than you actually realise. At the time, we didn't think that. We thought we could be able to pass our way through the league. And you can't do that in the conference, as, as we found out. But it just changed our way of playing a little bit. And we went a little bit more direct. We was a lopsided formation, but everyone knew, worked out how we would play. And we'd cheat a little bit with Andre higher and Benno was the focal point and Guts would be the free roll. And it, was, it all worked and we was very, very connected as a team and it, it worked out very very well um, so extremely extremely enjoyable moment of my career yeah
Any games in particular stand out? I mean, there's so many, obviously, we won so many, so yeah, it's, it's no, quite they, good. They were, all, they were all quite amazing, to be honest. I think every game we went into, especially here, when we did the unbeaten run, it was, mm. everyone felt like everyone was going to score in that game. Mm. Um, for me, it was my best score in tally, obviously. I know I'm taking penalties, so a little bit easier, but um, yeah, it was just enjoyable. I was going onto the, the pitch full of energy and thinking, this could be it, this one. Mm. Um, and yeah, it was a little bit different to the other years. Not down to anything else, but it was just something clipped. And was it good to actually go to these games? I think I, I, I always talk about it, and people probably at home thinking, stop asking about Alfredton and Braintree. Mm-hmm. But those previous seasons where we'd go there mm-hmm. and not turn up and be able to go there that season and, uh, and do it was, I think, from Luton fans' perspective, a sign that we were doing the right things. Did, as players, did you kind of think, the same in, in, in that kind of thing. hundred percent. We had people like Makar and Ronnie Henry who had been there, done it all. They've seen everything you can imagine. So it's not a, you're not turning up somewhere and you, you know, the changing rooms aren't quite what you, you thought it'd be. The pitch is not quite nice and smooth and as easy as it'd be. But it, it's horrible and it's a tough place to go. And these, these teams aren't just sort of walkovers. They, they will put up a fight and they're mm. playing Luton Town. So you've got 2,000 Luton fans there as well and it's an opportunity. So it's a, it's a it's tough to go to them places, but we also had a bit of a, I don't know, a bit of pride behind us at that mm. point where we had Ronnie who wouldn't take anything from anyone and he was a leader, Maka who was solid, as everyone knows. Um, we had a real core around us that we, we, we were unbeatable and we, we generated that internally to then put it onto the pitch was quite something. And it sort of evaporated to all the club. Fans were starting to believe again on the unbeaten run and I think it was Dartford away where it was 1-0 down and coming back to win 2-1. and. Things were happening that weren't normally happening. Andre scoring a header, just <laughs> things like that. Yeah. Um, it was starting to go our way a little bit, but obviously I think everyone would say the Cambridge game was a real, mm. real time where it, the tables turned and we went past them in the league and it, we sort of mm. kicked on that no one see we could do. What was the feeling in the dressing room after that Cambridge game? Because I, th- I think we're still quite clear of Cambridge yeah, at that time. Yeah, but, yeah. You know, would have given them if they'd won and given them a bit of momentum, I guess. But you know, Cully's come, come up trumps mm. and managed to get his... Uh, yeah, um, they were a great side that mm. season as well and I think they were probably annoyed that we were actually decent as well because with the one going up mm. automatic. Um, but the feeling was like, right, this is ours now. This is ours to lose mm. and we're not going to let anyone take it from us sort of thing. Um, and we had a little bit of hunger and fight between us when we were, we were in the games and even in training, people didn't want to lose a five-a-side. Um, and it, we, it, it all come together all of the pieces of the puzzle actually worked and, and John was leading us in the right direction and it was, it was the best season I've ever been involved in by a long way. And that feeling when you got your medal and we, I think we won against Forest Green out here and we lifted <laughs> the trophy, what was yeah. that feeling like? For me, relief. The, the pressure that I felt and that I carried personally because I wanted to with the club of all them bad times that I've gone through with the fans and, and seeing the negativity, like I say, on the bus as a kid and things like that. It, it, come off my shoulders a little bit and I was like, do you know what, we, I've done it sort of thing and I've done it with everyone else obviously, but I'm part of that. Um, the club was rebuilding, obviously the, the board that I took over were sensational what they were doing off the pitch and it was just, I was proud to be part of it and proud to not, go, not only go through the bad times but proud to start them on the journey again. We had Pelly in before you and I asked him how did it make him feel when we were crowned champions that season. And he said to me he, he loved the fact that people like Jake Howells were able to celebrate and have that lift off their mm-hmm. shoulders. How does that make you feel, knowing that Pelly is, he, he, he's kind of recognised the fact that you'd gone through all those bad times that I was <laughs> regaling about mm-hmm. earlier for you to, you know, come back and, and not redeem yourself in any way, don't need kind of any mm-hmm. kind of redemption, but to be able to show everybody that you know, you're, you're, a, you're a title winner and you've got Luton back in, in the Football League. It's nice, absolutely it's nice. And obviously from fellow pros and looking at Pelly now, obviously I'm so happy and proud of him. To, I think a lot of people have got short memories and that's just football and that's just the world we're in and the industry we live in. But the people out there that do realise that I was with them and I stuck with them and I stayed with the club all of these bad times, like you say, Hyde and things like that, to see them where they are now, it still gives me that same emotion, even if I was playing. And honestly, I'd pay so much money just to be out there and play one game. That's all I'd want. Um, 
to see if one, if you think you, you were good enough, obviously, but also just to experience it again, because you never get that back. I think even now looking at it, and I retired probably two, three years ago now, I'm only 32 and it's probably too young, I know, but it, I'd do anything just to play at Kenilworth Road. And I never got that chance to come back and thank everyone to, who supported me the whole time. Um, obviously, I still try and keep in touch with as many people as I can. But yeah, it's, it's really nice to hear people do recognise that I wasn't just sort of with the club when it was mm. not as good. Um, but yes, yeah, it's, it's a nice feeling. We played 334 games. I had to look it up before I came out. I didn't know that <laughs> off the top of my head. But good. I mean, anyone, any in particular kind of stand out? I mean, it must be, I mean, I think you're 17th in actually in the all time. Mm. I think 1,300 players have played for Luton and you're in number 17. I didn't know it was 1,300. Yeah. That's quite good. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. I mean, you, you've, you, you've certainly gone down in, in the history books, probably the youngest player to get to that, to that tally as well. So, yeah, there's a lot of stats out there on Twitter and all of these things and I think I've, I follow one at the minute where it's saying how quickly someone got to 300 appearances or yeah. how many wins in their first 100 games so my name pops up here and there which is yeah. nice um, for me now it's more my I've got three boys and if they can see dad used to play here or you can watch online a YouTube yeah. normally a penalty that I probably <laughs> I'd only show them that I scored but anything like that just to show that dad did do something mm. somewhere and he was part of a journey mm. and obviously part of this journey where they are now it's quite it, for me that's more than anything i ever wish for um, but also to have family and friends to come and watch me with my name on the back of my shirt especially my dad to see that for me is yeah that that makes everything i've done worth every every second no it's uh, really appreciated jake and as uh, obviously this piece is also a, not just a look back at the conference days but also you know, give fans a little bit up of an update of what you're up to now. So, I mean, talking earlier, and, and you were, we're here because you were here at the club shop in town. So tell us yeah, about it. so I now work at the company called Foco, and they, we basically supply all of the club shops, all of their merchandise outside of the, the kit, obviously, um, and also have like a licensing program as well, along with all the clubs. So, we work with probably over 150 clubs. Um, as I said, I'm at Man United tomorrow with them guys, and then out to Bayern Munich, Borussia Dortmund, PSG. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm keeping busy. Mm. Um, still in the game. Still in the game on the retail Some, yeah. side. It's different. It, you can see the effect now mm -hmm. of what happens on pitch to how it affects the retail side of things. Um, but yeah, I'm still happy, healthy, into my running, love my running, um, go for running as much as I can. I'm doing the marathon next year for a children's charity. So yeah, I, I want to keep being me and, and raise as many funds as I can for charities and, and keep my boys happy and my family safe. That's, for me, that's what I'm about. Okay, Jake. Well, thanks for your time today. Pleasure. Thank you for all of those uh, blood, sweat, and tears you put out there for Pleasure. 300 odd games for Luton, and in particular that season that got us back in the football league. Thank Jake, you very much. Thank you. Welcome to the Christmas table, guys. I have to give him eye contact. <laughs> <laughs> all, right, all right, all right, all right. What do you call Santa when he stops moving? <laughs> <laughs> that is a really good joke. <laughs> joke is terrible! <laughs> <laughs>